Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to our uh, George Stamatoyanopoulos lecture, um, an award session today. Um, so I'm thrilled to see as many of you here as there are. Um, the good news is the attendance at this meeting as of last night was 2,617, which is the second highest ever. And if you call your friends and get them to register, then maybe we'll surpa surpass Boston, which was in 2001, kind of before we had a dip. Um, with the economy and, and gene therapy as a field, uh, having kind of a nadir there. Um, but if we work hard, we can surpass that record for me or next year for Helen um, when we have the meeting um, in uh, Boston. But we're also the victim of our success um, with this record attendance obviously straining the capacity of this venue, um, which we booked several years ago when we had almost a thousand less people coming to our meetings. So, you know, room sizes are limited. Um, the bandwidth for the hotel in terms of live streaming to overflow rooms is also limited. So we apologize for the people that were unable to get into some of the rooms yesterday due to crowding and exclusion of some of you from uh, your desired sessions. So when we come back to DC in a couple of years, we'll be at a different and larger venue. But we are, in addition, recording audio and video for all the scientific symposia and education sessions. And with speaker permission, so speakers, please give us permission, those will be available on the ASTCT website um, in approximately a month or two um, after the meeting with access for ASTCT members and uh, registered meeting attendees initially with public release um, and access uh, a few months later. So everyone should have a chance to see their desired presentations for the first time or to review your favorite uh, talks. So I hope that'll help um, with the crowding issues that we've had. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, present the next award. Um, the ASGCT uh, Sonia Scarlatos Public Service Award recognizes a person or group that has consistently fostered and enhanced the fields of gene or cell therapies. Sonia effectively designed, advocated for, and managed grants and programs focusing on cell and gene therapies within the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for many years. She died prematurely in 2017, really at the peak of her career, and it was a big loss to the NIH as well as to our field. So it's really difficult to imagine a more fitting recipient for this year's um, PSA award than George Stamatoyanopoulos, who is Professor of Medicine and Genome Sciences at the University of Washington. Um, as many of you know, George was a founding president of ASGCT, and thus it's particularly appropriate to, to give him this award at the 20th anniversary meeting, although clearly I think this award was long overdue. So George's thoughtful, energetic, and very determined approach has been absolutely central to the growth and success of both our society and to the field. He brings an unforgettable style of persuasion to any topic, as many, as you know, many of you know, but always supported by data and by passion. He's contributed as a scientist, clinician, with over 400 research papers, as a mentor to many leaders in academia and societies, as a husband and father to two other incredible scientists, and as an honest spokesperson for our field. Um, we will show a video that we recorded about eight weeks ago, before George um, unfortunately had to undergo very major surgery, complications of which um, are preventing him from being at the meeting in person at his beloved ASGCT. He has never missed a meeting previously, despite you know, some other health problems over the years that would make most of us want to stay home in bed. Um, so Tony Blau, who is one of his many mentees who's made seminal contributions to gene therapy, is interviewing him in this video about the founding of ASGCT, the first annual meeting 20 years ago, and his predictions for the future of our field. So after um, today, please reach out to George electronically to thank him and congratulate him and tell him that we missed him today at the meeting. Hopefully he's watching this through live stream and will be participating together with us as we honor him. So let's give a hand for George Stamatoyanopoulos. And uh, take a listen to this five-minute video that I think summarizes George and our field very well. So I thought that we need a society so to give forum to the young people, forum to the postdoctoral fellows, forum to the graduate students. And they go and they give their papers in oral presentations. They have the posters, so we give them future. So I decided to make a society. So we put a board of directors, and they were enthusiastic, and we had the first meeting with the board of directors. Then <coughs> I thought, in order to have a good society, we need to have excellent program. 
And I was very impressed by the American Society of Hematology, in which um, scientific committees are making the program. So I started right away making scientific committees. So we made 10 scientific committees, and each committee had uh, 10 to 15 members. So right away, we had uh, over 100 people, uh, members of the society, by being members of the scientific committees. And these people, they have postdoctoral fellows, and they have uh, connections. And the other thing I started is uh, regular type of committees, like uh, program committees, uh, education committee, and so on. So in, by putting together committees, we have ad about 200 people to start with the society. Then we start working on, on, on the meeting very early, from 1997. In the middle of 1997, I started working on the meeting. And they asked the uh, scientific uh, committees to put together programs. So they, every committee proposed uh, one or two scientific programs, but we didn't get money. Yeah. So what to do now? How you can we <laughs> meet you without money? And there is when NIH saved us. Because, um, as you recall, it was a situation with the orkin motarski report, which was quite negative for gene therapy. But uh, the report was very good. And even now, if you go to read this report, you will see how excellent it was the report. And the report was saying essentially what I was believing, because my belief was that we can have gene therapy future if we have very strong science, and if we have a society which is very strong in science. So the fellows and the, uh, and the professors come there in order to enjoy science. So there was a report of the NIH saying exactly the same thing. So I used my beliefs and my report and the report to talk to the directors of the NIH, who right away understood the importance of having a scientific society on gene therapy, which is focused on science. But you know, I, w I had faith that the, the whole thing is going to succeed. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was fun. Yeah. How many people attended the first meeting, roughly? I think there were about 1,800. So it was very good. We had uh, 761 abstracts in the first wow. meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So the convention center in Seattle, there is a, 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 a escalator, a long escalator. Yeah. So I was staying at the top of the escalator, seeing who is coming. In a while, there were all these people <laughs> coming up. It was a, 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 a tremendous feeling of success. Yeah, I yeah, mean, it yeah. was, yeah, yeah. So about the future, no, I never doubted about the society. And the reason I never doubted, because I, I never doubted about the science of gene therapy. From the beginning, we started the society for science. We have very rigorous, excellent science. Because really, the gene therapy depends on science. I mean, and I never doubt. I mean, we had problems over the years, but uh, always I was thinking that the society is going to succeed. I, I put my time and my emotions and my dynamism and my work habit to set it up. That's it. at what we did today, I mean, we do have you know, 2,700 people almost, um, and think about George doing this basically himself for 1,800 people and 700 abstracts at the first meeting in Seattle. So uh, I, I kind of shudder to think how he, how he did that. It's really amazing. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is present the Excellence in Research Awards. Um, so Dr. Helen Heslop, who's uh, next year's president, um, will help me uh, take care of this uh, um, gratifying task. Um, this is for postdoctoral fellows, uh, graduate students, medical students, or other types of students who had top rated abstracts at the meeting. So please hold your applause until we call up all uh, six recipients. Um, and each recipient, please stay.
until the end so we can acknowledge you with our applause. So a postdoc, uh, Haikun Kim from Stanford University for his abstract entitled, A Three Prime tRNA Derived Small RNA Affects Translation in Rapidly Dividing Cells and is a Target for Hepatocellular Carcinoma. The second is Swapna Kalu from Oregon Health Sciences University. A single amino acid in AAV capsids regulates the requirement of the assembly activating protein for assembly. This is a postdoc award. Um, the next is a student award, Cheyenne Kurakawa from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. The immune system is a determinant of response to oncolytic measles, vir vi measles virus virotherapy. Um, the next student is Jacqueline Robinson Ham from Duke University, talking about dystrophin restoration in a humanized mouse model of Duchenne muscular dystrophy by gene editing with Staph aureus Cas9. The postdoc award is from Patricia Thakur from Duke University, um, talking about in vivo gene silencing with Staph aureus CRISPR Cas9 repressors. And finally, the last student award, Kevin Urack from the University of Iowa talking about treatment of sepsis by neutralization of extracellular histones with nucleic acid aptamers. So let's give them all a round of applause for these diverse and exciting abstracts. Okay, and now we get to our George Stamatoyanopoulos lecture. And I'm excited to introduce Dr. Eric Olson, and he'll be giving a lecture on correction of Duchenne muscular dystrophy by genomic editing. Dr. Olson is the Annie and Willie Nelson Professor in Stem Cell Research and Chair of Molecular Biology at University of Texas Southwestern. He's devoted his career um, to deciphering the mechanisms that control the development and fu function of both cardiac and skeletal muscle, and using this knowledge to advance novel therapies, such as uh, CRISPR gene editing to treat serious heart and muscular diseases. He's published over 600 papers. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a recipient of numerous awards that are too, uh, too long to cite here. He's founded several biotechnology companies to bring his discoveries forward to patients. And if uh, you're coming uh, to the Library of Congress uh, party tomorrow night, um, you'll hear him performing um, as a musician um, with uh, John Tisdale's band that many of you heard last year at our event. Um, uh, Dr. Olson plays in his own band back in Texas called the Transactivators, inspired by Willie Nelson, and I think it's quite fitting that he's the Annie and Willie Nel Nelson professor in stem cell research. I think it's great to have outside hobbies that can sometimes benefit uh, your professional career. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Olson up here and listen to his lecture. All right, I am really happy to be here. Thank you for that introduction. I'm relatively new to this field and have not attended this meeting before, so I'm especially honored to uh, be recognized by the George Staminopoulos uh, Award. He's a true icon in the field of, of molecular biology. So I'm going to talk to you today about one uh, recent foray of our laboratory into applications of genomic editing to correct muscle disease, which is the reason that I'm here today. And by way of disclosures, uh, I'm the founder and chief scientific advisor of Exonics Therapeutics. Now, I know many of you here do not work on muscle, so I thought I would put our work in context. Muscle provides the meaning and the mystery of life. Every beat of your heart, every blink of your eye, every breath you take, every move you make. <laughs> Transactivators are working on that song. Uh, is due uh, to muscle. From the many of the most wondrous aspects of, of nature, the, the ceaseless beating of the hummingbird wing 90 times per second to the movement of the largest animals that have ever roamed the earth. It's all due to, to muscle. Every aspect of art, uh, music, there's my benefactor on playing the guitar there, uh, music, athleticism is all due uh, to muscle. My neuroscientist friends don't like to hear me say this, but 
You can function without a brain. <laughs> Teenagers do it all the time. <laughs> but there is no, there is no life uh, or meaning to life uh, without uh, muscle. So today I want to talk to you about one muscle in particular, and that is skeletal muscle. This is, as I think all of you recognize, the largest tissue in the human body, accounting for roughly 40% of body mass. It represents the sole output of the nervous system, and it's the most regenerative uh, of all tissues. But I think it's also humbling to realize that muscle is also the source of many of mankind's uh, most insidious uh, diseases. And this is an enormous, for the young people in the audience, this is an enormous area of opportunity for exploration, uh, discovery, and uh, development of new therapeutics. Keep in mind that there are more than 750 monogenic neuromuscular diseases in more than 400 different genes with all sorts of functions. And I think it's fair to say that while there have been dramatic therapeutic advances in many of these diseases, there is as yet no long-term cure uh, for any of them. And so there's, there's really great need for research based on a solid platform of basic science uh, in this area. Now, perhaps one of the most tragic of muscle diseases is the, the disease I'd like to focus on today, and that's Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. This is a disease that affects uh, boys. The prevalence is roughly 1 in 5,000. It's the most common uh, lethal uh, genetic disease of early, of early childhood. And it affects um, approximately 300,000 boys worldwide. The disease is typically uh, recognized first by uh, the mother of the son who, who notices that the son fall, is perhaps faltering on the playground or having difficulty walking up the stairs. This is a, a, typically at the age of two to three. And then it can be uh, initially diagnosed uh, by the pediatrician through uh, what's known as the Gower sign, where they ask the young boy to stand up and they have to use their arms to, to push themselves uh, upright. And from the initial diagnosis, the genetic diagnosis of this disorder, there is no escaping the long-term clinical consequences of this disorder, which progress from uh, difficulties in uh, ambulation during the early years to loss of ambulation and confinement to a wheelchair, typically by the teenage years and into the 20s. And this then uh, continues to uh, breathing difficulties due to diaphragmatic failure and ultimate cardiomyopathy. And the typical life expectancy for these uh, boys is uh, two to three uh, decades, always culminating uh, in uh, loss of life around that uh, time. The uh, disorder is uh, caused by mutations uh, in the dystrophin gene, which we'll talk about, which is carried on the X chromosome. About two-thirds of the cases are transmitted from unknowing uh, mothers who are our carriers, and as, all, as all of you uh, well know. Females have two X chromosomes, so if we depict the, the mutant dystrophin, uh, the mutant gene dystrophin responsible for this disorder here in red, a female carrier will be uh, essentially normal because she'll have a wild type copy, but uh, the offspring from this couple will uh, be sh shown here. Any boy that receives the mutation from the mother will inevitably develop the disease, and 50% of the, of the male offspring from uh, this couple will uh, develop the disease and the other uh, half of the boys will be normal. And among the, the female offspring, uh, one half will be carriers uh, of the, the disorder and the others, other will not. About a third of, of the cases are, are sporadic uh, in nature. So the, the disease is caused by mutations in the dystrophin gene, as I mentioned. And you can think about the dystrophin gene as a stabilizer or a shock absorber for muscle, schematized here. So this large protein connects an adhesion complex at the cell membrane known as the dystroglycan complex with the underlying cytoskeleton and it's, uh, of the muscle. And it's necessary to maintain muscle uh, membrane integrity during the continual contraction and relaxation of, of skeletal muscle fibers and, and cardiomyocytes. And so this is what the typical uh, 
staining pattern of dystrophin looks like by immunostaining. So this is a cross-section through muscle fibers, and you can see every muscle fiber is underlaid by this homogeneous distribution of the dystrophin protein, which is required to maintain their integrity. So to look a little more uh, deeply, this is the um, dystrophin uh, gene and the dystrophin protein. I, I, sh I should mention the dystrophin uh, gene is a, uh, it's a massive uh, gene encompassing uh, 2.6 million bases uh, in, in length. If you want to think about how big this gene is, it takes 16 hours for RNA polymerase to traverse this gene from stem to stern and make one copy of the RNA. So this is, this is a big gene. And it uh, has, there's more than 4,000 different mutations uh, that have been identified uh, in uh, this gene. So here's the, the dystrophin protein schematized here. It has an amino terminal actin binding domain and the C-terminal region uh, involved in uh, integrating this into to the membrane. And so again, I want to come back, I'll come back to this throughout the talk, the analogy to the shock absorber. If you think about the shock absorber analogy, you need to have the two ends of the protein intact to, to maintain it. But the central region is comprised of essentially a, a, a series of reiterated rod domains or springs that, that maintain uh, its structure. But many of those are dispensable. This is the structure of the, the gene, the 79 exons that compose it uh, with the different domains color coded upon them. And I think most or all of you are aware that the, the structure of the intron exons in this gene indicate whether, if they're compatible, it indicates whether splicing between them maintains the open reading frame between those uh, exons. Now, when nature invented this gene, it was obviously complex, and nature did not want to uh, fool around with it. So the intron exon organization, and even the, many of the sequences of the flanking the intron exon junctions are identical. Uh, in mouse all the way to human. And this is important because we can extrapolate studies from uh, the mouse uh, to uh, thinking about how to fix uh, human mutations. So the, the central region, as I mentioned, is dispensable in, in part for function as long as the two ends of the protein are intact. And we know that because there's a large population of patients with a mild form of muscular dystrophy called Becker's muscular dystrophy. And they, they harbor uh, internal, in-frame uh, mutations uh, that uh, keep the two ends of the proteins uh, connect, uh, connected. And so really one of the, the long-term goals in the, the field of Duchenne has been to convert uh, Duchenne, DMD, into Becker's muscular dystrophy, BMD, to restore the uh, complete reading frame in, in this protein. So over the past 25 years, there have been major efforts to correct this disorder with a by a variety of approaches, and some of them are, are shown here, and we've heard some beautiful talks at this meeting already about uh, using some of these approaches, in particular uh, the use of uh, mini genes uh, encoding dystrophin to uh, restore uh, the protein. None of these approaches uh, has so far provided long-term therapeutic uh, benefit to the patients that need them, and many of them, I, I believe, are not realistic for uh, long-term therapy. I'll, for example, if you just think about um, myoblast transfer, it's difficult to, to, in, to envision the restoration of 40% of the body mass uh, by transplantation of myoblasts. And because the ultimate cause of death in these boys is cardiomyopathy, one thing we've learned in recent years is that exogenous cells do not colonize the heart very effectively. And so th this type of approach probably will not uh, provide long-term uh, benefit to these types of patients. And I won't go into all the, the details, but there's been extensive and, and excellent work done in many of these areas. Now, a few years ago, we decided to ask whether it might be possible to apply CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to permanently correct mutations uh, responsible uh, for Duchenne. And I know most or all of you are familiar with uh, this technology, so I won't go into it in detail, but there's a few points that, that will be important for what I say throughout the talk. So this, this DNA modification enzyme system is based on a bacterial immune system, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it involves many different endonucleases, the most commonly used of which is called Cas9. So Cas9 is a double-stranded nuclease that can be delivered with precision to any sequence in the genome by providing a guide strand RNA with complementary to the sequence of interest. And if there's, in the case of Cas9, if there's a dinucleotide sequence, known as the PAM sequence adjacent 
to uh, this region of guide strand homology, then the enzyme will cut. And this will be important for what I'll say later in the talk. The, the, the PAM sequence for Cas9 is either NAG or NGG. So when Cas9 cuts, if a DNA template is provided, then this DNA template can be introduced at the cut site and it can lead to precise modification uh, of the genome through homologous recombination or homology-directed repair. If a DNA template is not provided, the enzyme will cut, but then the DNA repair machinery of the cell will repair this cut, but it occurs in an imprecise way and leads to, the, uh, to insertions or deletions, so-called indels, uh, at, at that region. And this is through a process known as non-homologous uh, end joining. So in the initial proof of concept test of whether this technology could uh, restore dystrophin in an animal model of Duchenne, we used the most uh, widely used model of the disease, the MDX mouse, which harbors a, a single uh, mutation in the 23rd exon that imposes a stop code on here and it prevents the formation of the, the translation of the essential C terminus. And so in these initial uh, experiments, we performed what's known as germline editing. So in this type of study, what one does is take fertilized mouse zygotes and to micro-inject them with Cas9 RNA, a guide RNA to direct Cas9 to this site, and a wild-type DNA sequence to perform homology-directed repair. And then these injected uh, fertilized uh, zygotes are reimplanted into uh, foster mothers, which give rise to, to offspring. Now, when one carries out this type of, of germline editing, the offspring that result are mosaic. And that's because the editing process takes place with various timing and various variable efficiencies during the early cleavages of the embryo. But that really provided us with a bonus because that enabled us to go back and ask, what is the minimum level of gene editing that one might need to restore a functionally relevant level of dystrophin protein uh, in this animal model. And so this is um, a typical result. Uh, so this shows a, a one representative muscle stained for dystrophin in green, and you can see that every fiber is underlaid by the dystrophin. Here's the MDX mouse, which lacks uh, dystrophin protein. And here's an animal that came out of this germline editing experiment in which we showed that there was only 17% correction of the, the genetic lesion in this mouse, but there was really quite dramatic restoration of dystrophin positive myofibers. It wasn't perfect, but it was very, uh, quite remarkable. And here's an animal that had 41% correction at the, at the locus, but it was completely indistinguishable from wild type with respect to dystrophin positive uh, fibers. I should mention that it, it's been estimated, and again, this, this is an estimate, but it's been estimated that if, if one could restore roughly 15% of the level of dystrophin pro normal dystrophin protein uh, in a patient, it, it could have a dramatic therapeutic benefit. And so that's very encouraging because it's, it should not be necessary to bring the dystrophin protein all the way back to 100%. Even a modest level of dystrophin may have a benefit in these patients. And this really uh, encouraged us uh, to uh, continue. So we, we puzzled for a long time about why is the efficiency of restoration of dystrophin protein in a myofiber more efficient than the efficiency of editing at that locus? And I think the answer lies in the unique biology of skeletal muscle. First of all, skeletal muscle, all the mus skeletal muscle in our body is multinucleate. It forms by the fusion of myoblasts to form these massive fibers which contain thousands of nuclei. And so we believe that even editing of the mutation in a small subset of these nuclei to restore dystrophin may have consequences beyond the locale of that nucleus due to the, the syncytial nature of the muscle fiber. And, and secondly, muscle has a, an intrinsic stem cell population known as the satellite cell, which is activated in response to injury and then fuses to replenish and reform the, the um, injured muscle fiber. And so we believe that if the satellite cell population can get corrected at the site of the mutation, that it will provide a reservoir for permanently uh, restoring uh, muscle structure and function uh, in this animal model. Now, following this initial work, there were several issues that were brought forth, and uh, appropriately so. And so 
for the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to address the ways in which we are, are trying to uh, confront these issues. The first is that the initial studies involve germline editing, and germline editing is not ethically uh, appropriate nor practical in humans uh, at the moment, although it, it has been it recently from the National Academy of Sciences, there was a statement that said this may ultimately be appro approvable uh, in certain settings, and in the UK they have a approved, uh, at least in principle, uh, exploration of human germline editing, but we're not uh, going there for, th for this talk. The second point, which is a big one, homology-directed repair is not believed to occur in post-mitotic tissues, although I will say that Jeff Chamberlain has recently published uh, that uh, it can occur in uh, skeletal muscle, so that, may, uh, that conclusion may warrant further um, consideration. But in, in general, it has been uh, thought that uh, homology-directed repair will not occur in post-mitotic tissues. Heart and skeletal muscle are post-mitotic. So for us, this was a big issue and it said we couldn't use the HDR pathway. We had to figure out how to use non-homologous end joining if we were going to try to rescue this disorder. Another uh, issue is that there are thousands, more than 3,000, in fact, mutations in the dystrophin gene that have been identified in boys worldwide. And so how, how are you going to correct thousands of different genes in a practical way in these boys? And, and lastly, the delivery of gene editing components to the heart and to muscle was an obvious uh, challenge that needed to be confronted. So this, again, comes back to the structure uh, of the dystrophin gene with its 79 exons, and here's the structure of the protein. The most common mutation in boys with Duchenne is a deletion of exon 50. This is a hotspot region of the gene. And so when exon 50 is deleted, exon 49 splices to the ensuing exon 51 you can see the shapes are incompatible. So this puts the C-terminus out of frame. And so as a consequence, the essential end of the shock absorber is not expressed, and this, this is uh, dysfunctional. This exon 50 uh, deletion accounts for roughly 13% uh, of boys uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we, we really wanted to, to try to apply gene editing technology to a, a, re a, a relevant a mutation for the human population, but there, there was not a mouse with this uh, mutation, so we made one. Uh, we used CRISPR-Cas uh, to delete exon 50 from the mouse uh, dystrophin gene, and that, again, puts it out of frame, just as in the human. And here's an analysis of those mice. So in this case, dystrophin is stained in red, underlies every muscle fiber. Here's the mouse. We call it the delta exon 50 mouse. It has no dystrophin at all. And typically, when boys are, are diagnosed, they can uh, be diagnosed by a blood test in which a, a muscle enzyme, creatine kinase, is elevated in the serum, uh, indicative of leakage of uh, skeletal muscle and heart. And indeed, when we looked in the blood of these mice, they um, had roaring levels of creatine kinase, indicative of the muscle damage. Uh, and I won't go through all the uh, pathophysiological analyses that uh, Leonella Amawasi and our group who made these mice uh, undertook, but uh, suffice it to say that we think that they reflect a, a bona fide uh, model of the human, uh, most dominant human uh, mutation for Duchenne. So in, in thinking about how we might correct then this mutation, we, we looked at, again, more deeply at the uh, recognition sequence for uh, SPCAS9 that we had used in the germline editing. And as I told you, the recognition sequence is AG or GG. So, so this was a real uh, eureka moment because it was obvious then that one could use the splice junctions of any exon to deliver, to direct Cas9 to cut at that site. And moreover, not only at splice exons, but if an AG or GG exists in an exon and one wants to make a cut or a deletion there, one could use Cas9, SP Cas9 to do this. So if you want to think about the, the beauty and the, the logic of, of biology, just think about this for a minute, that bacteria has an ancient immune system, hundreds of millions of years old, that evolved to eliminate invading viruses in bacteria, and it relies on an endonuclease 
that cuts at this AG sequence. And that AG sequence is the same sequence that's the universal splice uh, acceptor sequence for all animal exons. It almost makes you want to believe in intelligent design. Uh, but this suggested that we could use the bacterial endonuclease for exon skipping by simply making a guide strand close to, either within the exon or near the splice junction, to erase the AG, and then just let the, the splicing and transcriptional machinery take over and splice from 49 to look for the next AG and go to the next exon, 52, and put the protein in frame. So then uh, what we did was we had to uh, figure out how to deliver this uh, in, uh, in mice, and so uh, we engineered the CRISPR-Cas components into two sets of uh, viruses uh, a, of AAV, and uh, I am not an authority in this area, and I know there's many authorities in this room, so I will tread lightly here. Uh, but th this AAV9 uh, serotype that we used has tropism for muscle and heart, uh, as many of you know, and we packaged uh, the Cas9 in one version and the guide RNAs in another and used also a variation of a muscle-specific promoter to direct the expression of Cas9. And we injected the, this, these viruses uh, into um, various mice. Initially, studies uh, in uh, this paper alluded to here were done in MDX mice, and in work I'll talk to you about that's not yet published, we've adapted this to the, the mouse with the dominant human uh, exon 50 deletion to ask if we could eliminate splicing of 51 and cause skipping from 49 to 52 to put the protein back in frame. So here's the initial results. This is a histological section, and this is a cross-section through the entire muscle. This is the tibialis anterior muscle, with, which is a muscle of the leg, but pretty much any muscle we look at is the same. So this gives you the, the view of the whole thing, and in this mouse model, there is uh, severe degeneration and regeneration of inflammatory infiltration and fibrosis of the muscle fiber. And here, four weeks after uh, systemic, this is uh, intraperitoneal delivery in this case, systemic delivery at an early age and looking at uh, several months later, uh, you can see that there's restoration of the histological integrity of the muscle fiber. And so this was really, for us, one of the first indications that this approach might, in fact, uh, have the ability to uh, restore uh, function in this animal model. So this shows the immunostaining for dystrophin in the entire muscle fiber. So here's the wild type. Every muscle fiber of the tibialis anterior is positive for dystrophin. Here's uh, in the mouse with the delta exon 50 deletion. There's no pos dystrophin positive fibers. These are just uh, autofluorescence from necrotic cells. And then here is uh, four weeks post-systemic delivery. You can see that this muscle fiber has been re restored almost uniformly to dystrophin positivity. Uh, here you can see a more a closer view. Here's two different, I just picked two representative muscles. We've looked at many, many of them. Here's tibialis anterior and triceps, uh, homogeneously demarcated by the presence of dystrophin beneath the sarcolemma. Here's the, the mouse with the delta exon 50, devoid of, of muscle. And then here is the efficiency of rescue at four weeks after injection. So take-home message, the systemic delivery of AAV encoding the gene editing components can, by exon skipping, restore dystrophin expression in a mouse model of, of the human disease. Now, one of the things that we were really interested in was to ask, okay, so you make dystrophin, but it, does it get to where it's supposed to go, and is it really functional? And so, as I mentioned earlier on, dystrophin is incorporated into a multi-protein complex at the membrane called the dystroglycan complex, which is essential for function. Dystroglycan complex has been beautifully uh, characterized uh, by Kevin Campbell and others. And here you can see that in wild-type mice, dystrophin, two components of the dystroglycan complex, beta dystroglycan and alpha dystroglycan, or alpha sarcoglycan are expressed underneath the membrane, and then this mutant mouse with the Delta 50 uh, mutation, they're not expressed above background, and they are restored, not perfectly, but remarkably well, I think, uh, by the, the uh, editing of the dystrophin gene. So to me, this was also uh, really unexpected and, and uh, reassuring that you could take an animal that never made this big protein in the history of its life from embryogenesis to adulthood. And with a single editing step, you can 
recreate, restore the production of that protein. But not only that, it goes to the right place in the cell and it can reconstitute, renucleate the multi-protein complex that's required for its function. And so, so that was really encouraging. And I, I neglected to mention, I should to do so now, that um, with respect to the AAV delivery uh, in the MDX, uh, MDX model, which was, were the initial studies that we carried out, there were uh, also complementary uh, studies carried out uh, by Charlie Gersbach and Amy Wagers that uh, also uh, resulted in the same conclusions that uh, AAV delivery can uh, correct dystrophin expression in that mouse model. So what about the heart? The heart uh, is the ultimate cause of demise uh, in these boys due to failure of cardiomyocytes. And here you can see the effect of uh, systemic gene editing on cardiomyocytes. In, here's a section through the heart of the, of the uh, Delta Exxon 50 mouse, no uh, dystrophin positive cardiomyocytes. And here, four weeks after systemic delivery of gene editing components, there's very strong restoration of dystrophin throughout the heart. Not every myocyte, but quite, uh, quite extensive. So we've tried to quantify the extent to which this approach can restore dystrophin, and uh, this shows western blots of the protein in duplicate, so wild-type mice. The protein, again, is, as you know, is a massive, 250 kilodaltons. The deletion 50 mouse has basically no dystrophin. And here in the heart, four weeks after systemic delivery of the gene editing components, you can see the restoration of, uh, of, of dystrophin proteins. It's about... Uh, 80, 80 to 90 percent of the normal level of the protein we believe is restored as shown by this uh, and other uh, experiments that I won't go into today. So what about function? We, we think muscle function is also uh, improved by this approach. There's many measures of that. Here's one. This is what's called a grip strength test which measures the, the strength of the forelimbs of the mouse. So in, in the uh, mouse with the delta X on 50 deletion, there's about a 50% diminution in muscle strength that uh, I think these experiments are about four to six weeks of age, four weeks after systemic delivery. And then uh, here you can see uh, the restoration of muscle function uh, in, these, in these mice. And similarly, I told you that creatine kinase in the serum is an indicator of muscle leakage. You can see that here. And then following uh, g systemic gene editing to restore dystrophin, CK levels are uh, dropped, not all the way to background, but quite, quite dramatically. And we've looked at many other parameters. Uh, so we believe that there is a, uh, a generalized benefit on uh, muscle uh, function and, and structure by this approach. Now, I, I told you then that these studies were done with this mouse here, where we deleted exon 50, putting 51 out of frame, so we then skipped 51 by the skipping to put it back in frame. And that, we think that covers roughly 13% of, of the population of boys with Duchenne. We've gone on then and have made uh, three additional mouse models of uh, human uh, Duchenne exon deletions. I won't go into them in all de in detail. This shows the percentage patient coverage that we believe would be uh, represented by these uh, mouse, uh, mouse mutants, representing about roughly 40% of total patient mutations. So for this one, here's an interesting uh, one. Uh, this exon 44 deletions are seen in about 11 to 12% of patients. You can rescue that um, in either of two ways. You can skip exon 43 and connect 43 to 45, or you can leave 43 intact and skip 45 and put the protein back in frame. And here's the third most prominent hotspot, um, deletion of exon 52. That causes uh, out-of-frame mutation because 51 splices to 53, and you can rescue that by skipping this splice junction, 53, and put it back in frame. And then here's the fourth most common, uh, which you can see. You can skip exon 44 to rescue a, a four, exon 43 deletion. So we, we think these mice represent a... Uh, a useful platform for testing uh, exon skipping strategies as well as uh, other strategies for correcting uh, Duchenne and we're happy to provide these mice to anyone who thinks they might be useful for whatever approach you're currently taking. So one of the challenges that I've shown you on the previous slides is that in order to analyze the efficacy of benefit 
in these approaches, you have to sacrifice the animal. So you basically get a snapshot at one time. And you can't, in the same animal, monitor the progression of the disease or the restoration of function. And so we wanted to develop a mouse model that would enable us to monitor in real time the correction of gene mutations. And so uh, Leonella Amoasi built this mouse, the luciferase uh, mouse, where she knocked in using CRISPR a luciferase reporter with a protease 2A cleavage site uh, in frame with exon 49 of uh, the dystrophin gene. And so now this provides a surrogate in vivo marker for expression of dystrophin because you can just look at, uh, at, at luciferase luminescence. So here you can see, here's two of these mice. Here's a normal mouse. Here's two of these uh, luciferase, dystrophin luciferase mice. And you can see they express really intense levels of luciferase through all the muscles uh, and the heart. And so now we can then monitor dystrophin expression without having to sacrifice these animals. And we can do that uh, over time. So what uh, Leonella did was to go back then and to introduce into these mice, the, again, the exon 50 deletion. So she deletes exon 50. And that puts the C terminus out of frame, as you know. And so now luciferase expression will be extinguished in these mice. So you can see that here. So here's a, the, the dystrophic mouse harboring the luciferase reporter that's been switched off because of this out of frame mutation. But then we can use these and come back with a AAV to do the, the what we call it, we call it myo-editing. I should have mentioned that, the gene editing step. So we do myo-editing to skip exon 51 and put this back in frame and ask can we restore luciferase expression uh, as, as the surrogate marker. And um, here's how she did that. So this shows the, the mouse uh, which has the luciferase in it. And this is the, suppose this is the dystrophic mouse that we made. And then we can inject AAV with encoding Cas9 or a guide RNA. And then we can just monitor these mice in, throughout their lives for the uh, reappearance of luciferase. And here, here you can see that. So here's, here's a, the luciferase mouse. It's expressing uh, luciferase as a marker for dystrophin in muscle. Here's the delta exon 50 luciferase is extinguished. And here's, in this case, she just did an intramuscular injection into the lower limb of CRISPR-Cas in AAV9. And you can see now, to really remarkable levels, luciferase expression is restored. Uh, and this is four weeks after injection. So now we're using these mice to monitor timing and to optimize uh, and improve efficacy of this approach. So this comes back to the 79 exons. And I told you those exons are largely conserved with respect to splicing patterns in humans and uh, mice. Uh, there are 12 exons highlighted here which represent the so-called top 12 hotspots for mutations uh, that account for somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of uh, human Duchenne mutations. So it's been estimated that if you could design ways of skipping these exons in the patients that uh, have mutations in these regions that you might be able to correct up to 80 percent of those mutations. So we have screened and identified optimum guide strand RNAs from the human genome for skipping of each of these um, 12 exons. And so now coming back to this concept that there are 4,000 different mutations, it's not necessary to make a guide RNA to cure every individual mutation. You can categorize these mutations into each of these exonic hotspots and then pick the guide strand for skipping of that exon. And so you can, in principle, rescue large uh, percentages of these by this approach. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So finally then, how do, to make the leap uh, from animal models to, to humans? And we're, we're moving in that direction. I'll just share with you in the last few minutes some of our um, efforts. So we have a muscular dystrophy clinic uh, in Dallas. And patients can come in. They can be genotyped and phenotyped. And if they have an interesting mutation that we haven't yet studied, we can make iPS cells from a small blood sample of, of those patients and then uh, convert those in a simple step to muscle, either heart or cardiac muscle, in a dish. And then we can use these optimized human guides to ask, can we correct this human mutation? Uh, originally, we were doing this by uh, obtaining blood samples from uh, boys with interesting mutations. But there's, there's, so many, there's so much interest in this and so many letters from distant places in the world with people with interesting mutations that we can't get to. So we just recreate the mutations in human iPS cells if they're interesting and then ask if we can correct them. So here's, here's an example. So this is 
an example uh, of a, a young man who has a deletion in the hotspot region of exons 48, 49, and 50. And so in this young man, 47 splices, here's this nefarious exon, 51 splices and it's out of frame, so uh, he cannot make uh, dystrophin because the C terminus is out of frame. And here's cardiomyocytes from this boy, stained for troponin and dystrophin in green, and there's no dystrophin in his cardiomyocytes. So we generated one of those optimized guide RNAs for this exon 51 region, directed Cas9 to that site, and asked could we induce skipping to the next exon 52. And so here's the result. So now this uh, boy's cardiomyocytes derived from his blood by IPS technology can now be induced to express dystrophin uh, in, in green, which they have never uh, expressed. Here's a western blot. So here's uh, the dystrophin protein again, 250 kilodaltons. Here's the uncorrected cardiomyocytes made from IPS from this patient. And here's the correction. So uh, the, this is, I, I think, a uh, quite efficient approach for uh, correction. And we've applied this to a number of deletions. So not only does it uh, restore dystrophin expression, by many, many parameters it restores function of these myocytes. Here's just one parameter. This is a uh, measurement of calcium transients in, indicative of, of uh, contractility of cardiomyocytes, IPS-derived cardiomyocytes in a dish. Here's four individual cardiomyocytes. One of the consequences of Duchenne uh, of dystrophin mutations is that, it, as I mentioned, it perturbs the integrity of the membrane and causes calcium leakage and uh, arrhythmias. So you, you can see that these cardiomyocytes are arrhythmic in their contractility, and when we perform myo-editing to put the protein back in frame, you can restore normal contractility. And I won't go into the data today, but we've also shown you can restore normal uh, bioenergetics and mitochondrial function in these uh, myocytes. So this is a source, a great source of uh, personal motivation for me. This is a young man that lives in my neighborhood. Ben Dupree, he, he doesn't mind me showing his picture. He and I have done many public interviews on the radio and TV, uh, and this is his mother, Debbie, and his cardiologist. And there was a, a very well-written uh, article uh, recently uh, by Antonio Regalado, if any of you are interested in how uh, CRISPR-Cas can be uh, applied to Duchenne. He, he really covered it well. The title is a little bit confronting, but uh, I want to uh, talk about uh, Ben's uh, mutation because I think it's really informative. So Ben has um, one single nucleotide error in his three billion letters of DNA. And that one letter is in an intron. And so, you know, you would think, what's the big deal? One letter in an intron. But that one, one single letter change put him in a wheelchair. And Here's where it is. It's between exons 47 and 48 of the dystrophin gene. He has a T, which is what we normal, normal people would have there. It's converted to a G, AG, the universal splice acceptor sequence. So his 47th exon of dystrophin splices to a false exon in that intron, 47A, and there's a stop code on there, so he can't make dystrophin because of that one-point mutation. But we looked at that, and sometimes, you know, sometimes everything just lines up. And we looked at that, it was amazing. AG was the PAM sequence for Cas9. So inside his disorder was his cure. And so we designed a guide RNA to direct Cas9 at the AG sequence and ask, if we just delete the AG, can we put this thing back in frame and make normal, uh, normal dystrophin? That's what happened. So here's, these are Ben's cardiomyocytes from his IPS cells, stained for dystrophin. They don't make dystrophin. Here, following the single step of just deleting. Just have, all you have to do is make an indel. It doesn't have to be specific or precise. It just delete that AG sequence and it splices to exon 48 uh, and it restores uh, dystrophin uh, protein. So uh, the, the last type of mutation I'll just mention quickly and, and then I'll begin to wrap up is duplications. How do you fix duplications? These are really complex mutations. Here's a duplication in a young man of exons 55 through 59. It's, it's duplicated twice and he has another slight 
deletion here between exon 55 and 56. That serves as a molecular watermark, so you can actually follow this. We looked at this and we thought, okay, in the duplication, he actually had a duplicated uh, potential target for CRISPR-Cas. So again, we could use a single guide with Cas9 and cut this duplication at both ends on the reiterated sequence and excise this large duplicated region. This is a large region, it's about 110 kilobases, uh, and uh, then try to restore uh, dystrophin expression by eradicating uh, the, the duplicated region. And here's the result. So here's wild-type cardiomyocytes. Here's this boy's cardiomyocytes. They don't make dystrophin. But by delivery of Cas9 to this site, you can now restore dystrophin, shown here by, by immunostaining. Now, I, I want to make one more point about Cas9, and then I'll, I'll tell you about this other uh, endonuclease, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. And that is, there are many ways that you can envision directing Cas9 to a mutation to fix it. I've talked to you about trying to keep it really simple. Simple guide, one guide directed at a splice junction or a nearby region, make a cut and then hope the indels uh, reframe the protein. But there are other approaches that have been uh, pioneered by several people in, in this room, Charlie Gersbach and, and others, which can use two guides. Uh, Dong Sheng Duan has also done this, as uh, has Jeff Chamberlain. You can use two guides to excise the large region, and that, that can also work. Uh, in our case, we've just tried to keep it really simple with one guide to minimize complexity and minimize possibilities for off-target uh, effects that would likely be increased by using multiple guides. But there may be uh, settings in which two guides are preferable, and there may be settings where one guide is preferable. So everything I've told you about so far has been to use uh, Cas9, shown here, which has these properties, and you know now about the, the, the PAM sequence and here's some other characteristics of its cutting. There is a whole uh, smorgasbord of uh, enzymes that can carry out CRISPR modification. Feng Zhang has really described a lot of these beautifully. One of them, just one of them, is called CPF1. And we decided to just test CPF1 for its ability to do gene editing because it is, uh, it uses a different PAM, uses a T-rich PAM. So there may be settings where uh, this PAM might be preferable to uh, Cas9 PAM, and the PAM is 5 prime of the cut site, whereas the PAM of, of Cas9 is 3 prime. The cuts are staggered, and Cas9s are blunt, and there's other things. Another uh, advantage uh, maybe for AAV packaging is that CPF is considerably smaller than Cas9, which is at the limit of packaging uh, of uh, AAV. So we decided to see whether CPF1 could represent an alternative route for uh, correction of Duchenne. So we again went back to this one uh, young man's uh, mutation with the 48, 49, 50 deletion to ask if we could use it to skip exon 51. And wow, CPF1 is really efficient. Yeah, you can see that here. So here's this boy's cardiomyocyte stain for dystrophin, and here's following CPF1 editing. Uh, you can see their dystrophin in red. They're uh, efficiently restored to dystrophin positivity. And we tested CPF1 in vivo. We went back and did a little bit of germline editing to just ask if it would work in vivo. And here you can see the results. So this happened to be with the MDX mouse. But it, so in MDX, you know, there's no dystrophin in red. Here in muscle of diaphragm and heart. And here's three animals with mosaic editing, 8%, 25%, and 50% 50, 50 editing. And you can see quite efficient uh, editing in vivo by CPF1. So these are the uh, categories of mutations uh, that exist uh, in boys, and these show the potential uh, impact of uh, CRISPR-Cas on editing of these types of mutations. I've shown you that uh, this technology can skip stop codons by bypassing those exons and putting them back in frame, and in this case, the corrections are partial. That is, they eliminate an internal exon, but they maintain the majority of the protein, so it's essentially converting Duchenne DMD to BMD. I've shown you that you can uh, very efficiently restore out-of-frame exons like the exon 50 deletion or the many others I described to you. And these, again, are partial where you are putting out-of-frame exons frame and missing the intervening exons. I've told you, I haven't gone into all the details, I've told you that you can correct duplications by uh, cutting at reiterated intronic sequences flanking the duplicated exon. And although this is somewhat less efficient because it often requires 
cutting out large segments of the genome, as I described, uh, it certainly will work. And if it's only a single exon duplication, it works really well. And I think it's important to note that this type of correction is perfect, seamless. So once it's corrected, the protein is completely reframed. And then I told you that we can correct pseudoexons like Ben's mutation by eliminating the s default splice junction, which puts the protein back in frame. And this creates perfect correction uh, with the protein indistinguishable uh, from wild type. So this is uh, where we are, uh, I think, in the field, not just in our lab, but in uh, many others that are working in this area. We can certainly uh, generate uh, cardiomyocytes from patients or muscle cells from uh, patients uh, with Duchenne using IPS technology, or we can create any mutation we'd like in normal IPS uh, by CRISPR technology. We can correct, we believe, 60 to 80 percent of human mutations by uh, this approach that I've described to you today for delivery of, of CRISPR uh, enzymes to those sites. It's certainly possible to make as I've shown you, mice that harbor the dominant human mutations responsible for this disorder, and it's possible to correct those mice by delivery of AAV uh, components in a relatively efficient way. And so the final step, which uh, we all recognize is perhaps the biggest step of all, is to translate this work uh, towards humans. This is going to require um, scale-up uh, and uh, extensive safety and optimization uh, studies. Uh, with respect to safety, uh, it's commonly uh, questioned whether this approach will lead to a pathogenic off-target effects by inadvertent uh, cutting by uh, CRISPR enzymes at uh, loci that are required for, for health or for preventing cancer or whatever. I should say that we have we've done quite extensive sequencing of all the predicted uh, off-target effects within coding regions for Cas9, and we have not seen any off-target effects. doesn't mean they couldn't exist sometimes somewhere in some cell of, of a body. But I, I, so far, and I think others work in this room and elsewhere would uh, corroborate this, it does not look like as yet there are going to be any uh, game-changing off-target effects that will hold back this technology so, so far, and, and we'll have to see about that. Uh, other issues that need to be addressed are issues of immunity uh, for uh, dystrophin, although I, I don't think that will be a major issue for two reasons. One is because most of these boys are on um, mild immunosuppression anyway, and also because there's a phenomenon known as revertant fibers, where a very small number, perhaps 1% or less, of the fibers in boys with Duchenne express dystrophin due to imprecise splicing. So there, in some cases, there's actually exon skipping that can generate a low level of dystrophin protein that has then exposed the immune system uh, to dystrophin. So uh, that hopefully will not be an issue. So to move this forward, it can't really be done in an academic laboratory. And so we've uh, started a biotechnology company called Exonics Therapeutics. And we're trying to leverage the technology and the knowledge base that I've described to you, as well as the animal models, to try to move this, uh, move this forward. And many uh, members of the company are here. And I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you about our work. So uh, lastly, I want to acknowledge the people that uh, did this work. Uh, the work on gene editing was initiated by a student in our lab, Cheng Zhu Long, and he has his own laboratory now at NYU. All the AAV work that I centered on today was done by Leonella Amawasi, who's at this meeting. She can answer all hard questions about AAV. Uh, and then we've had many other students, uh, technicians, and postdocs that have uh, contributed to this work, and my long-term colleague, Rhonda basil uh shown here. Uh, has also played an important role uh, throughout these studies. And on that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So thanks so much for that really exciting science, as well as just a beautifully clear and, and uh, concise presentation. While people are walking up to the microphones, um, what about immunity to um, the nuclease itself? Um, did these studies all get done in immunocompetent mice or immunodeficient mice? Uh, these studies were done in immunocompetent mice, and I, and I think immunity to Cas9 is going to be something that's going to have to be looked at by, not just by us, everyone that's using Cas9 uh, in vivo. So far, mice have not shown adverse uh, immune responses. There was uh, one paper 
uh, published by George Church and Amy Wagers where they looked a bit at this and it didn't look like this was gonna be a uh, showstopper. Identify yourself when you ask a question. It's dark up here, so we can't Jacques see you. Tremblay from Laval University. Uh, your approach is converting a Duchenne patient into a Becker patient. But as you might know, there are some Becker patients which are very severe and they are bound to a wheelchair at 13 or 14 years old. And this depends on the structure of the protein. So by removing complete exons, you are not restoring the normal structure of the spectrum like repeats, which are important for a normal function of that protein. Would you like me to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, an alternative approach is to create uh, hybrid exons, and I have published a paper just a few weeks after yours which show that this is perhaps a better long-term approach because I'm afraid that uh, complete exon skipping will do the same thing as exon skipping and it might not uh, re do a, a complete pay a restoration of the function of this trophin. So um, Dr. Tremblay is a pioneer in this field and I appreciate your question. Uh, several points I can make on that and as you well know, uh, exon deletions in the central rod region can have varying consequences on the stability of the protein and the clinical outcome. There are some uh, patients with uh, deletions in internal exons that live well into their 70s uh, and are still ambulatory, and there are others that actually display a DMD phenotype. So I think it's important to carefully assess what is the consequence of skipping of a specific exon on the ultimate protein product, and, and I think that uh, through the use of IPS technology as well as through the use of these mice that harbor the dominant mutations, we can test various exon skipping strategies and perhaps reach conclusions as to what is the most stable and functionally relevant uh, version of dystrophin um, that could be generated by this approach. I think it's also worth noting that there are many different exon skipping strategies that are being uh, developed including certain oligonucleotide drugs like a Teplerson and others, and all of these uh, will uh, ultimately have to confront the sorts of issues that you're addressing, as will the microdystrophins, and that is to what extent can a, a reduced dystrophin protein restore complete health uh, in these boys. And my, my last point, and then I'll go on to the next question, is that Several of the mutations can be fully corrected. I gave you some examples of that. I, I think with duplications, they can be fully corrected. It, the efficiency is an issue there, but the protein that can be produced by those corrections is correct, is uh, normal, and pseudoexons, as in Ben, can be fully corrected. So I, I think these are really interesting questions that we need to continue to explore. I, I must add that I share with you your enthusiasm for a long-term treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy with CRISPR technology. Thank you. Uh, Steve Russell from Mayo Clinic. Um, as, as I understand from what you were saying about correction in the mice, you need to give two AAV vectors intravenously. And you also said that the cells need to be dividing in order to correct. And so I'm just wondering, have you done dose response studies and you know, how does the dose impact the outcome and what dose do you use for those beautiful outcomes that you show? Okay, and so second, what's the age of the mice and you know, are they at a very young age where they still have cycling um, cells? Okay, so you, you ask a lot of questions. Let me see if I can remember them all. Uh, the AAVs, we used two AAVs, one that is optimized to express uh, Cas9, and the other can express whatever guide strand, uh, guide RNAs that you would like. We, we use the two guide approach for two reasons. One is because the experts in this audience know there are limits in the size of packaging in AAV. But secondly, if you can identify an optimized AAV for expression of Cas9, then you can just plug in a second AV to express the guide, R whatever guide RNAs you need, and that's relatively simple. If I said, and I, if I said that this approach has to occur in dividing cells, then I'm sorry, I probably misspoke on that because one of, I think one of the strengths of 
the approach that we've taken is that muscle is a non-dividing post-mitotic tissue, and so you can't use, at least with great efficiency, uh, homology-directed repair that only occurs in proliferating cells. You have to use uh, non-homologous end joining, which is unique to quiescent cells. And so that's why I, I think this approach is very effective uh, because it can work in post-mitotic cells like muscle. And I, I think also, if you, th you want to think about possible off-target effects or cancer-inducing possibilities of uh, off-target effects, perhaps m tissues like muscle and heart, which are permanently post-mitotic, may mitigate some of those possibilities because you're not going to make tumors in, in those tissues by possible off-target effects. So I'm sorry, your next question? Dosing. The dose response question and the dose that you use for correction. Yeah, so uh, that's a really good question and we have been uh, fooling around with that. The dose I believe that we've used for the experiments I showed was 2.67 times 10 to the 13 viral genomes per kilogram. Uh, and those uh, titers were measured by PCR, and we've delivered that. Most of our initial work was intramuscular, and I'll tell you one thing about intramuscular, and that is if you do intramuscular, you will observe remarkable editing in the heart. I think it must be due to leakage into the circulation and the he heavy vascularity as well as tropism of the virus to the heart. Uh, but systemically, most of our work has been done by, uh, so far, has been injection at early age, uh, a week or so after uh, birth, and a analysis at many months later. The MDX mice that we edited, we've analyzed them out over a year. The, the Delta Exxon 50 mice I described are so new and not even published yet, we haven't had time to carry those out beyond several months. Thank you. Uh, come from uh, uh, Applied Stem Cell. Um, for your uh, duplication patient, um, you, as you said, the cut a big, big piece uh, out is uh, uh, very le uh, less efficient. Why don't you just uh, use your uh, uh, action scaping uh, again, just uh, modify the uh, uh, splicing signal and put it back in the frame? It's a reasonable question. I, I think for small duplications, it might be possible to do that. For the type of duplication I showed you, which was just one dramatic uh, representation, there's a very large number of exons there. And if you were to put that back in frame, you end up with a, a dysfunctional uh, dystrophin protein that's, that we, we don't think probably folds correctly just because of the uh, insertion of a large duplicated region. So, uh, you know, again, this comes back maybe to Dr. Tremblay's question, and that is it, it may be important to look at these types of mutations on a case-by-case -case basis and to model it. I mean, the beauty of this is you can do it in the actual cells from the patient with the disorder, and you can look at the function of the dystrophin protein that's made from it, and then you can model that in the types of mice I described and then really use that knowledge as the platform upon which to make uh, decisions about moving programs forward clinically. Chris Mueller from UMass. I, I would caution uh, over interpreting immune responses in mice. Uh, I, I don't think that would be predictive. In fact, in the latest intramuscular trials with alpha-1, we actually generated an immune response to a single amino acid change to a human protein. Um, so I would put that in that context. Are you planning to do any studies, at least in primates, to look at the immune responses against Cas9? Uh, we are considering that right now, and I, I think your points are, are well taken. I've pretty much told you everything we know uh, as of this point. I, I think immune issues are paramount going forward. Of course, as I mentioned, uh, there, tra immunosuppression will be is also on board in these patients. So whether we do the primate study is something that we're really having uh, extensive discussions right now with uh, the experts on. Okay, uh, Ping Guo from uh, uh, UT Health uh, at Houston. So uh, my question is, is after your correction, this uh, dystrophin, so the whether the you check the fibrosis or the uh, inflammation? in the, the, your mouse or the human? Uh, yes, uh, it's a good question. So fibrotic infiltration is a consequence of this disorder. We've looked at fibrosis and 
I showed you a little bit of the histology, but not all of it, and that can be uh, prevented by uh, early uh, gene editing. Your question also raises a, a point that's, I think, worth mentioning here, and that is, I think, if this type of technology, if can reach clinical translation, I think ultimately the earlier the intervention, the better. Uh, to This type of technology, I believe, can has the potential to prevent the progression of the disorder, but it's less, it's more difficult to imagine that it can reverse the disorder once muscle is lost and replaced by fibrotic tissue. So I think early intervention uh, is, um, would be the ultimate uh, way to go if this can, can move forward. Okay, last question. Leon Morales from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you mentioned that the patients are in, under immunosuppression and the, the reverent fibers that might prevent the immune responses from your approach, but any concern about the T cell repertoire that fails to be negatively selected during thymic development? I, I think all those uh, immune issues, and you bring up a good one, are issues that we and others will need to be mindful of going forward, and we have our eyes wide open on that. Uh, but at this point, uh, we're still really just trying to optimize this to f determine what is the most functional form of dystrophin that we can generate in the most efficient manner by this approach. And then once we have settled on that, which I think we're really close on that, then we will begin to address those sorts of very relevant issues. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for attending this session, and let's give uh, Dr. Olson another hand.